Hello and welcome to the G3 Pulse podcast. Our guest today is Abune Bagan Vatula. I hope I didn't uh, pronounce that too badly. Um, Chief Technology Officer at Quixent. Um, Abune, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Louis. Glad to be here. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention to, uh, right from the off is that um, uh, being unable to travel to G2E um, and uh, not being able to uh, uh, to get over to the States until I think the, the first date is about 8th of November now uh, in terms of Brits heading over there. Um, but you were you were on site, you were uh, at the scene um, and I wanted to know what your thoughts were on the event and um, just kind of fill us in a little bit of background detail, details on G2E. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, like, like being in the gaming industry for over uh, 15 years now, I think gaming shows are a really exciting part of uh, our business, but it gives us an opportunity to really meet up with uh, a lot of our customers. I think it's, it's a very niche industry where, you know, we really uh, try to, you know, use those opportunities to build relationships and really, you know, uh, grow our uh, opportunities, new pipelines and so on. But uh, G2E has always been a coveted gaming show, and in all my years in the ga uh, gaming industry, this is one of the shows that I uh, most look forward to. And mm. the excitement uh, was really high, given that we had missed last year, and it's been a very challenging year for all of us uh, with the pandemic. <clears throat> so um, there was definitely a lot of excitement, and but also there were a lot of unique challenges leading up to the event, uh, sure. and a lot of speculation. And uh, despite, I think, all of those challenges, G2E turned out to be a very successful and positive show. So even given with, you know, the kind of turnaround as some of the industry sources have pegged around, you know, one third of the uh, 2019 attendance, I think, you know, there was definitely a lot of positivity. A lot of our gaming manufacturers uh, were there with new products there. Uh, we had the opportunity to really, you know, uh, catch up with a lot of our key customers, uh, talk to a lot of key suppliers and stuff. So uh, overall, I think with everything uh, uh, that has been with this year's show, it has been a very positive show. So in terms of um, in terms of scale and size, um, but also um, a little bit in terms of visitors, were were visitors quite local? Was it was it more of a national event, and was was a scale was it a, kind of a bit of a scaled down event as well? Absolutely, I think you could say so, given that uh, with the travel restrictions and others, uh, we did uh, see that 80% of the uh, visitors were more local to the North American market, okay. uh, though we had, uh, you know, some representation from outside of North America. Right, okay. Um, and what was the focus of um, the kind of the custom inquiries on the booth? We, what were you able to actually show? I know uh, it's been difficult to actually get um, equipment over to the States as well. Um, you know, uh, were you actually able to show everything that you wanted to? And what was the kind of the key um, focus from customers on the booth as well? Absolutely. I think, you know, basically uh, we've been able to, we've been working hard last year to really get uh, the product that we want to get to our customers. Okay. But, you know, again, with uh, this year especially has been challenging on many fronts for the gaming industry. And as markets opened up, um, you know, there has been a huge demand for product this year. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, there have been unprecedented supply chain shortages yeah. and delays, shipping delays. And that has been affecting uh, delivery of product to our customers. So, you know, uh, customers' inquiries were more focused on the supply chain challenges. When would those uh, ease really so that, you know, they could meet the uh, demands of the market? Okay. So, you know, another central uh, discussion point was uh, around the end of life. So because of the supply chain issues, uh, a lot of uh, suppliers uh, have been in the situation where they were unable to deliver product or a lot of the key uh, component suppliers have announced end of life. And it's all about how is the industry going to be adopting to make sure they have a product, given that the regulatory nature of this business requires uh, time for them to spin out a new product and deliver a new product. Okay. So for us, uh, as suppliers of uh, technology solutions and innovation, it was upon us to make sure that we provide customers with the options they need to deliver product with least disruption. So I think that was the core focus of what we, uh, uh, the inquiries from the customers and the products that we were showing at the booth. Okay, one, one of the things that's been a very kind of key focus for Quixent this year and, and, and last year and, and um, before that, but 
but specifically this year has been um, the things we focus on in terms of the software suite and that kind of added value. Um, how important was that at the show in terms of, and has that message kind of come across to customers as well now? Absolutely. I think you know, our clients value the offering of uh, the gaming hardware platforms uh, of QuickSense, which actually come with integrated software uh, tools and solutions. So yeah, our focus this year definitely was uh, showing uh, 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 value in terms of our software uh, hub offering that we have. So you know, the combination is a powerful, stable hardware and effective embedded software uh, that basically enables our customers to go to market faster. And as our customers uh, more are focusing on content, uh, as is important in this gaming industry, you know, for example. Uh, we have launched a product called Play, which was Quixen's VDR solution and okay. helps our customers to cut significant licensing costs and benefit from a powerful tool for their game rendering. So I think, you know, there was a lot of uh, interaction with our customers for that. And, you know, uh, it's more about adaptability and how that integration would happen. Uh, same way, there have been a lot of customers who are now actually entering into these new markets, which are regulated and which require a lot of regulated features. Yep. And uh, especially, I think, from that point of view, these customers uh, being their first entry into these regulated markets require those software solutions for ease of integration and launch. Okay. Um, my, my, my feelings whenever I come onto the kind of Quicks and Booth at any of the shows, and it's been a while now, but um, has always been about the, that type of hardware technology, about uh, the demand for faster, bigger, more. Um, and I just wonder, has that continued during COVID or, or, or has the pandemic kind of pinned back some of the expectations of customers? Um, do, you, do you think we've lost a year in terms of technological progress? We would think so, right? But uh, it's been the inverse, actually, what we have okay. seen. I think, you know, we have seen customers come out with uh, a lot of new content, a lot of new ways on, on how to deliver better content to these markets. And then better content always requires better hardware, uh, bigger and brighter displays. So I think, you know, it was interesting to see. And I think that's one of the reasons why the demand has been uh, catching up so hard is, you know, of all the new content the customers have come out with. Okay. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, we, we've seen some of the big gaming manufacturers uh, coming out uh, with some, I mean, for example, if I can quote, uh, Aristocrat has come out with their uh, Arch, which is like the Dune game. Yeah which is like, uh, you know, it was amazing. It's a massive game for the first time. They've yeah. released the game before the show has been released. Yes, so the there, team, yeah. Yeah, so uh, there has been a lot of uh, those integrations. Even uh, we have looked at booths at uh, Eruze or even Blueberry, where there are new ways of engaging the customer uh, with different game types. Uh, you know, you have one of these entertainment big games that is used as a bonus for a video game using an RNG on the machine, which is a slot machine. So I think that's a really new ways of how uh, the manufacturers are looking at of, uh, engaging players. And uh, it all requires more bigger and uh, better hardware. Yeah, does that, does that play into obviously um, the jealousy of not being able to see those booths um, at the show is, is quite um, uh, poignant at the moment. Um, but I mean, in terms of the change of demands for cashless, we've seen kind of a, a lot of talk about that from that side. Um, and omnichannel seems to be a word that was being used an awful lot at this particular show as well, as the large casino operators start to actually integrate sports betting into uh, into their offer. Uh, I just wonder, has that, has that changed the demand in terms of the kind of platform requirements? as well yes absolutely so um, I, it's, it's a very good point because I was looking at some of the reports uh, during um, you know the, the lockdown period and stuff and if you look at some of the markets like New Jersey or, or uh, others you've seen that the online revenue has increased by 400 percent yeah and that's a pretty uh, consistent trend across jurisdictions that have had online gaming and uh, I think, you know, that has brought in uh, or opened up new um, areas of opportunities. And with cashless that is coming in, you're absolutely right. Uh, we are hearing more of the omni-channel integration. Uh, yeah. It is not a new word, but uh, it has been there. But I think the adoption has been high now, given the situation and uh, what the markets are demanding. So there's a, there is an opportunity for a uh, convergence of online to land-based. That is what we are seeing. Yep. And I think it is uh, pretty evident even with the ETGs, which is the electronic table games. 
So electronic table games grew by 200% during these uh, last year. Okay. And that has been uh, attributed again to a lot of people playing this online uh, gaming, pokers and uh, other uh, electronic game, uh, table game um, opportunities that have now, you know, uh, pretty much uh, popped up across the US and I think more even in the European markets. Mm. And and does that apply to um, sports betting terminals as well? We, um, you know, that increased presence, have they, have they actually increased the presence in North America? And you know, obviously we've got single event betting now in Canada, um, now that that's legal. Uh, do you see, there was a lot of talk about sports betting terminals becoming quite a blow up in the States, but it seemed yeah. to have been kind of you know, less than expectations or say, has that, has that changed? Yes, it has. So uh, the main thing I think we've been talking about sports betting in the uh, in the United States for almost a year or two, and it was always uh, before the pandemic that it was a two to three year uh, timeline before you know it really mushrooms up here. And what has really happened is in the last year or so, you can see more uh, jurisdictions, more states uh, adopting the sports betting uh, regulations and are formulating these regulations and moving. So. We have seen that uh, the online sports betting, uh, part of that 400% growth on online has been yep. for sports betting too. And now we, what we are seeing a demand from uh, some of our key customers is for the uh, SSBT, which is the self-service betting terminals used for the sports betting. Yep. So uh, we are in works with at least uh, you know, um, uh, two to three customers on you know, certification okay. because uh, the GLI 19 and 20, I think you know, we have had a lot of integration conversations on a lot of go-to-market strategies in the last year. But right now we are at a stage where we are submitting products to GLI for approvals. And I think that is a, a key uh, and a very good progress that's been made. Mm -hmm. So we expect that uh, in the Q1, Q2 next year and uh, throughout next year, we will see uh, more implementations and um, integrations on the sports betting uh, platform on the land base uh, happening and growing. Mm. And does that kind of um, play out across all markets or are we looking at very kind of specific markets at the moment in terms of being um, concentrations of kind of interest and focus? Are, are we getting kind of, are we getting certain, you know, the US is, is a very kind of obvious example of uh, lots of interest at the moment. But it, it, can I get in the feeling that generally the markets are improving and, but are there still hot spots that are happening? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, the key thing is, you know, it's all about gaming has always been one of the industry that has been the key to raising revenues for state or local jurisdictions. Okay. And I think, you know, even if we look back in 2008 or, you know, 2018, sometimes when we had some of the, you know, economic downturns, gaming, a lot of industries have looked, or states and uh, uh, local governments have looked at gaming to uh, drive the revenues. And I think, you know, with the current situation, uh, we are seeing the same economies uh, really, you know, coming back to gaming as a means uh, for them. I think during the pandemic, Pennsylvania had uh, declared gaming as an essential service. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, these economic factors are playing in as we see sports betting not really focused to venue based, uh, like the big Vegas or, or New Jersey and New York jurisdictions, yeah. but more also to the local route markets. So uh, I think that is what is going to be playing in uh, next year as all uh, as the economies open up and states look at ways to improve their revenues. Sports betting will be one of the keys to help them drive that. Okay. Okay. That's really interesting. Um, and um, are, are you seeing that um, a benchmark at the moment seems to be that a lot of, a lot of companies are saying oh, 2019 levels were X. And then they're saying, you know, when are they going to return to those levels? How long is it going to take us? And are they back already? Do you do you see that we are returning to kind of whatever the normal uh, view is? But but twenty twenty nine levels at least, or um, are we are we kind of getting there faster, slower than expected? Absolutely. So I think you know, first thing is uh, looking at the positive side. We have uh, you know really outpaced and uh, meet our targets for twenty twenty. So everybody is happy. Yeah that we are out of the 2020, you know, challenges we've had and the revenues uh, and the um, overall gaming revenue, if you look at uh, with some of the AGM reports and stuff, uh, show that 
the 2021 has been at least a 90 percent in some cases 120 percent in the 2020 levels yeah. so if you really look at from that comparison you see we are almost uh, at the 2019 levels if not exceeded yeah. and i think with the demand the pent-up demand that we are seeing and the new market uh, demand we are seeing uh, it's i think we're on track to beat or exceed 2019 levels at least by end of this year or next year um i mean that's really that's really kind of positive um i, I guess another one of the the things uh, from the positive side and um to kind of wrap up um a chat with you abonne is um what what we've seen with covid covid has been a, a a bit of a catalyst for certain industries and it's been devastating for others um um listening to um the ceos discussing uh, the g2e show um from you know, from over this side of the water um they were talking about supply chain issues and described you know addressing the shipment by you know, sending product via uh, air freight and things of that nature and i also I, I, i'm just wondering has this actually been a catalyst for quicksand in some way of of actually um getting getting those guys to actually seek out new partners and new new relationships to in, ensure the supply of components and materials um and has quicksand seen seen really interest from new clients as a result absolutely i think you know um before i jump into that it's very funny because um you know uh, i was looking at uh, how the new car market is and stuff mm -hmm. and i've been told by some of the dealers uh, some of the dealerships are ghost towns and literally you have no inventory of cars and yeah. like you know some of the leading car manufacturers in the u.s have shut down all their plants mm -hmm. so it is a, a tough uh, supply chain situation we live in uh, yeah. but having said that you know we always look at positives and uh, you know i think one of the uh, things that quicksand has done this year uh, is proactively respond to that so we did yeah seek out a lot of new partners uh, in terms of uh, how we manage our components, more, our critical components, components that were short in supply or end of life due to these uh, situations and stuff, and have started working on uh, dual sources, multi sources, and mm -hmm. co designs and stuff. So, uh, yes, uh, that could help. And second thing is, as I said before, the end of life scenario has been one of the key factors this year too, that has been an issue for production. So really working, I think, quicks and I think where we stand is we've helped all our customers to build up that strategic stock. Okay. And this becomes challenging for some of the OEMs where they build their own product. And what we see is a, a trend of dri uh, driving towards the standardization and mm -hmm. outsourcing to yeah. minimize. And that's where we see opportunities really coming in. Uh, we're building a huge pipeline with new opportunities where customers really want to work with us as partners, to yeah. help them. I think you know it's uh, economies of scale as we build across uh, you know multiple products with multiple customers. Everybody benefit out of it. Mm. Okay, well, it's certainly something that uh, we want to kind of continue um, kind of investigating as we get into uh, uh, looking towards the ICE show um, and actually get to. Yeah. I think it was ICE twenty twenty when I met you on the uh, Quicksand booth. I, I look to look forward yeah. to doing the same again. I am very jealous that um, um, you were at the G two E show, and um, but you know it'll be great to kind of sit down with you at ICE and um, kind of explore a little bit more detail about what's been happening from the um, uh, the technology side, but also how 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 customers are changing the way that they actually work with Quicksense as well. So I look forward to that in the future. And uh, But in the meantime, thank you very much for participating in the podcast, Abine. Thank you for this opportunity, Louis. It was always great talking to you. Yeah, I look forward to speaking to you soon. Bye. Thank you.